chapters thirty seven through forty two of the book of ezekiel from the holy bible in modern english translated by ferrar fenton this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by mark penfold chapter thirty seven the hand of the ever-living came upon me and carried me out by the whirlwind of the lord and let me down on the plain and it was full of bones then it whirled me over them round and round and i saw very many on the surface of the plain and i perceived they were very dry then he asked me son of adam can these bones be revived and i replied you know mighty lord when he answered preach to these bones and say to them dry bones listen to the message of the living life the mighty lord proclaims i will bring a wind to you and you shall revive i will also put sinews on you and cause flesh to cover you and cover you with skin and put breath into you when you will revive and learn that i am the life i consequently preached as he ordered me and as i preached a sound came and i perceived an earthquake and the bone approached to bone then i watched and saw muscles come over them and flesh rise and skin cover them over all but breath was not in them he then said to me proclaim to the wind proclaim son of adam and say to the wind thus says the mighty lord wind come from the four winds and blow into the throats of these and let them revive so i proclaimed as he ordered me and the wind came to them and they revived and stood on their feet a very very great army then he said to me son of adam these bones are all the house of israel you know they say our bones are dry and our hope has faded we are exterminated therefore proclaim and tell them thus says the mighty lord be certain that i will open your graves and bring you from your tombs my people and lead you to the soil of israel then you will learn that i am the life when i open your graves and bring you my people from your tombs and i will put my breath into you and revive you i the life have promised and i will perform it said the ever-living the message of the ever-living came again to me to say now you son of adam select a stick for yourself and write upon it for judah and for the sons of israel his companions take another stick and write on it for joseph a stick for ephraim and for all the house of israel their companions then join them for yourself one to another as one stick and make them one for your hand and when the children of your people ask you and say will you inform us why you do this say to them thus says the mighty lord look i shall take the stick of joseph which is next to ephraim and the staves of israel his companions and join them to the stick of judah and make them one stick and they shall become one for my hand then hold the sticks you have written upon in your hand in their sight and say to them thus says the mighty lord look i will take the children of israel from the hand of the heathen where they have gone and collect them from around and lead them to their own land where i will make them one nation in the country on the mountains of israel and they shall have a single king to govern them and shall never more be two nations nor be again divided into two kingdoms they will not defile themselves again with idols and pollutions nor any of their rebellions for i will rescue them from all their faults in which they sinned and purify them and they shall be my people and i will be their god then my servant david shall reign over them and be their single shepherd to them all and they will conduct themselves by my decrees and regard my institutions and practice them and rest in the country that i gave to my servant jacob where your fathers dwelt you shall reside in it and your sons and grandsons forever and my servant david shall be your prince forever i will then make a treaty of peace it shall be an everlasting treaty that i will make with them 
and i will increase them and fix my sanctuary amongst them forever and reside with them and i will be their god and they will be my people then the heathen will learn that i the ever-living sanctify israel when my sanctuary is amongst them forever chapter twenty eight the message of the ever-living came again to me to say son of adam set your face against gog of the land of magog the chief prince of meshech and tubal and proclaim to him and say thus says the mighty lord i am opposed to you gog chief prince of meshech and tubal but i shall control you by putting my bit into your jaws and bringing you and all your army horsemen and cavalry all of them fully armed a numerous host with shields and bucklers and trained to the use of swords and pars cush and foot all of them with shield and helmet gomer and all his hordes the house of thorgarma from the far north and the whole of his hordes many peoples with you drilled and disciplined by yourself you and all your host and their hosts with you and you yourself shall be their commander prepared by yourself for a long time shall come at the end of the years to the country restored from its ruins with your recruits from many peoples against the mountains of israel that were a continuous waste but who have been brought out of the nations and all of them dwelling in security until you ascend like a storm coming on like a cloud to cover the land you and all your hordes and many peoples with you then thus says the mighty lord at that time thoughts will come into your mind and you will conceive a vile idea and will say i will attack a country of unwalled villages i will advance to a quiet secure population all of them without walls or bars and having no gates to plunder and loot to turn your hand against the re-inhabited ruins and against a people collected from the heathen practicing commerce and trade and residing on the top of the earth sheba and dedan and all merchants of tharshish and all her young lions will ask you have you come to plunder and rob have you collected your host to carry off silver and gold to seize commerce and trade and to plunder a great plunder therefore proclaim son of adam and tell gog thus says the mighty lord at the time when my people israel rest secure will you not know it and come from your home in the far north you and many peoples with you all of them riding on horses a great horde and a numerous army and you will come against my people israel like a cloud to cover the country it shall be in future times that i shall bring you to my country so that the nations may recognize me when i have distinguished myself upon you gog in their sight thus says the mighty lord you are the one of whom i spoke in former times by means of my servants the prophets of israel who proclaimed in the period of their life that i would bring you upon them but at that time at the period when gog arrives at the soil of israel the mighty lord declares it my indignation will be raised in my face and in my anger and fiery wrath i promise that at that time there shall be a great trembling in the soil of israel when the fish of the sea and the birds of the skies and the beasts of the field and all the things that creep on the face of the earth shall tremble before me and the hills shall be overthrown and the steeps shall fall and every wall in the country shall fall i will then proclaim against him a sword on all my hills and the sword of each will assail his companion says the mighty lord and i will execute justice upon him by disease and slaughter and pouring rain and hail of fire and rain brimstone upon him and upon his hordes and upon the many nations who are with him for i intend to magnify and distinguish and manifest myself to the eyes of many nations that they may learn that i am the ever-living chapter thirty nine so now son of adam proclaim against gog and say thus says the mighty lord i am opposed to you gog chief prince of meshech and tubal therefore i will incite you and induce you and bring you up from the far north and lead you to the hills of israel where i will strike your bow out of your left hand and your arrows shall drop from your right upon the hills of israel 
you shall fall and i will give you and all your hordes as food for the ravenous birds of all kinds and beasts of the field you shall fall on the face of the fields for i have decreed it says the mighty lord i will also send fire upon magog and the population of the secure coasts and they shall learn that i am the ever-living then my holy name will never die when the heathen learn that i the ever-living am beneficent to israel be sure it will come and be in existence says the mighty lord that day of which i speak then the population of the cities of israel shall come out and burn and fire the arms and bucklers and shields and bows and arrows and maces and spears and burn them for seven years as fuel they will not need to carry timber from the fields nor to cut it from the forests for they will burn the equipments as fuel and plunder their spoil and loot their loot the mighty lord declares and on that day i will give gog a place of burial in israel the vale of passage alongside the sea but it will make the travellers stop their noses and they will bury gog there with all his multitude and call the spot gog's defeat it will take the people of israel seven months to bury them so that they may purify the country all the people of the country will be burying them and it will be amongst them a day to celebrate my name says the mighty lord they will also appoint men to regularly go over the country to bury those who have dropped in scatterings upon the face of the earth to cleanse it they will be burying for a period of seven months when the searchers who examine the country perceive a human bone they will erect a beacon beside it until the barriers bury it in the vale of gog's host and the city also will be named hamona thus the country will be cleansed but now son of adam the mighty lord commands thus call to every kind of bird and to every beast of the field collect yourselves and come and gather around to the sacrifice that i will sacrifice for you the great sacrifice upon the hills of israel and i will feed you with flesh and quench you with blood you shall eat the flesh of heroes and drink the blood of the princes of the earth rams lambs and magnificent bulls all of them fat fleshed i will feed you to gorging with fat and make you drunk with blood at the sacrifice i shall sacrifice for you and will satiate you at my table with horse and mounted hero and common soldier says the mighty lord when i display my majesty to the nations and all nations see the decision that i execute and the power with which i control them then the house of israel will acknowledge that i am their ever-living god from that day forward and the heathen will also learn that for their faults the house of israel were transported consequently when they deserted from me i turned my face from them and delivered them to the power of oppressors and they all fell before the sword on account of the corruption and the sin they practised therefore i hid my face from them consequently thus the mighty lord declares i will restore the captivity of jacob and have pity upon all the house of israel and be in earnest for my holy name and remove their degradation and all the perversity with which they abandoned me when they dwelt in their own country in safety and without fear when i bring them back from the peoples and collect them from the countries of their enemies and distinguish myself in the sight of many nations then they will learn that i am their ever-living god who transported them to the heathen but who also will collect them into their own land and never abandon them there again nor will i again hide my face from them when i have poured out my spirit upon the house of israel says the mighty lord chapter forty in the fifteenth year of our transportation on the tenth of the first month of the year in the fourteenth year after the city was captured on that very day the hand of the ever-living came upon me and brought me there i was brought in the divine visions to the land of israel and was stationed on a very high hill and opposite it towards the south was a city as if being built when he brought me there i saw a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass with a flaxen cord and a measuring rod in his hand who stood at its gate this man said to me son of adam look with your eyes and listen with your ears and fix in your mind all that i show you 
because you have been brought for the purpose of having them shown therefore inform the house of israel of all that i show you i observed there was a wall around outside the temple but the man had a measuring rod of six cubits and of a cubit and a hand's breadth in his hand that was its length and he measured the entrance to the temple one rod and its height one then he went to the gate which faced towards the east and ascended the stairs and measured the threshold of the gate one rod wide that is each threshold was one rod wide with a lodge one rod long and one rod broad and the elevation of the lodges was five cubits and the platform of the gate at the side porch of the gate opposite the temple was one rod next he measured the porch of the gate eight cubits with its panels of two cubits this was the porch of the gate opposite the temple and the lodges at the east gate were three on this side and three on that side the three of equal measure and each of the porches the same size on each side then he measured the broad way of the gate ten cubits wide with an incline of thirteen cubits up to the gate with a seat of one cubit on each side before the lodges and a seat of one cubit at their sides the lodges themselves were six cubits on this side and six cubits on that side he next measured the gate from roof to roof of the lodges a distance of twenty-five cubits from door to door then he arranged a colonnade of sixty cubits with a colonnade all round the court of the gate and at the front of the entrance gate up to the front of the porch of the inner gate was fifty cubits the lodges and porches had latticed windows with verandas around the gates as well as verandas around the porches and windows but there were palms over the porches then he brought me to the outer court there i saw cloisters and a worked tessellated pavement all over the court there were thirty cloisters in the court and there was a tessellation at the sides of the gates the tessellation extended the whole breadth of the gates then he measured the breadth from before the tower gate at the front of the court with a veranda outside for one hundred cubits on the east and north he also measured length and breadth of the gate that faces to the north of the outer gate with its three lodges on each side and its porches and cloisters were of the same size as at the first gate fifty cubits long and twenty-five cubits broad with the windows and porches and verandas like the form of the gate that faces towards the east with seven steps ascending to it with a veranda over them there was also a gate to the inner court on the south a gate to the north and to the east and he measured from gate to gate a hundred cubits then he led me to the south where i saw a gate towards the south and he measured its porches and verandas the same measure of the others with their windows surrounded by verandas fifty cubits long and twenty-five cubits broad with stairs of seven steps and verandas over them with a palm on each side of the porch and there was a gate to the inner court towards the south and he measured from gate to gate towards the south a hundred cubits then he led me to the inner court by the south gate and measured the south gate the same as the others with its lodges and porches and verandas the same as them and its windows with verandas round them fifty cubits long and twenty-five cubits broad the veranda also around was twenty-five cubits long and five cubits broad with a veranda towards the outer court and palms over the veranda and eight steps ascending to it next he brought me to the inner court towards the east and measured the gate the same size as the others with its lodge and porch and veranda the same as them and its windows with verandas around fifty cubits long and twenty-five cubits broad with verandas towards the outer court and palms over the verandas on each side and eight steps ascending to them then he led me to the north gate and measured as he measured the others its lodge and porch and veranda and its windows around fifty cubits long and twenty-five cubits broad with its porch towards the outer court on each side and eight steps going up to it and near the porch of the gates there was a chamber fixed at the side of the stairs and near the porch of the gate were two tables on one side and two tables on the other side upon which to slay the burnt offerings and sin offerings and trespass offerings and on the outside of the stairs at the entry of the north gate were two tables and on the other side where the veranda of the gate is were two tables 
four tables here and four tables there at the side of the gate eight tables to slay upon there were also four tables of cut stone for the burnt offerings of one and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits broad and their height one cubit and the instruments with which they slaughtered the burnt offerings were laid upon them and shelves were fixed around the house of a handbreadth but the flesh of the gifts was on the tables and outside the inner gate were the chambers of the singers they were opposite the inner court on the north side of the gate and faced towards the south one was at the south of the east gate facing towards the north and he said to me this chamber that faces towards the south must be reserved for the priests of the temple the chamber also which faces towards the north must be reserved for the sacrificing priests who are of the descendants of zadok who approach to officiate to the ever-living from amongst the descendants of levi then he measured that court a hundred cubits long and a hundred cubits wide a square with the altar in front of the temple next he brought me to the porch of the temple and measured each jam of the porch five cubits on this side and five cubits on that and the width of the gate was three cubits on this side and three on that the length of the colonnade was twenty cubits and the breadth eleven cubits and they ascended to its veranda by stairs and pillars supported one side of veranda and pillars the other chapter forty one then he took me into the temple and measured the veranda six cubits wide on one side and six cubits wide on the other the breadth of the tabernacle and the breadth of the entrance was ten cubits with shoulders to the entrance of five cubits on one side and five on the other the length he measured as forty cubits and width as twenty cubits he then went inside and measured the two jams a cubit but the approach was six cubits and the breadth of the entrance seven cubits next he measured the length of twenty cubits and the breadth of twenty cubits facing towards the temple and said to me this is most sacred he afterwards measured the panellings of the temple of six cubits with a breadth of wainscoting of four cubits all round the interior and the wainscoting was panel above panel by threes and threes repeated but the panelling was laid close to the interior wall all round so as to be supported by but not to be fastened to the wall of the temple so the panelling spread and encircled tier above tier for they clothed the temple tier above tier all round the interior consequently they spread over the interior by tiers and so from the lowest went up to the higher and to the summit and i observed that the interior was enclosed from the foundations with wainscoting for a height of a full rod of six cubits at the side the breadth of the wall that was wainscoted was five cubits and there the house walls were completed the remainder was for the tabernacle there was also an interval of twenty cubits wide all round between the house and the sleeping rooms and through the wainscoting to give access there was a gangway towards the north and an entrance towards the south and a broad way left from the gangway of five cubits all round it with a wall that faced the side lobby towards the west of extent of seventy cubits and the pathway of this wall was five cubits wide and the length of its circuit ninety cubits then he measured the temple as a hundred cubits long with a lobby and its enclosures and its wall as a hundred cubits long and the width of the front of the temple towards the east and the lobby with its enclosures was a hundred cubits then he measured the length of the enclosure facing the lobby that is at the back of it with galleries on each side as a hundred cubits and the inner temple and the porches of the court with the thresholds and latticed windows and the surrounding galleries in three tiers around along with their platforms of smooth wood and from the ground to the latticed windows from the stairs at the entrance to the inner temple he measured exactly both the roadway and all the surrounding walls both of the inner and the outer which were constructed of carabim and palms with a palm between carob and carob and each carob had two faces that is the face of a man towards the palm on one side and the face of a lion towards the palm on the other side they were fixed all round the temple 
the carabim and palms were stationed on the ground up to the stairs of the entrance making an enclosure to the temple there were four doors to the temple and the front of the sanctuary shone like a mirror there was an altar of wood three cubits high and its length two cubits there were also cornices shelves and cupboards of wood here he said to me must be the table that is before the ever-living there were double doors between the temple and the sanctuary with two swinging leaves to the two doors two leaves to one door and two leaves to the other door and upon the doors of the temple were depicted cherubim and palms the same as were formed on the walls with a wooden awning in front of the porches on the outside with latticed windows and palms on each side at the entrance of the porches the temple was also wainscoted with wood chapter forty two then he took me out to the outer court towards the north and brought me to the sleeping-rooms near the lobby and near which is the northern wall the length of its front was a hundred cubits at the north side and the width seventy cubits upon the face the twenty that belonged to the inner court and over the pavement of the outer court were three repetitions of gallery above gallery and in front of the sleeping-rooms was a walk of ten cubits wide for the gangways a walk of a hundred cubits and their doors were northward the upper sleeping-rooms were narrower for the galleries diminished them more than the lower and middle stories for they were in three stories and were not upon columns like the columns of the courts consequently they were narrower than the middle and lower ones on the ground but there was another screen opposite the sleeping-rooms towards the outer court in front of the dormitories of fifty cubits long for the length of the dormitories of the outer court was fifty cubits and they were a hundred cubits in front of the temple and beneath these chambers was the passage from the east as an entry to them from the outer court in the extent of the enclosure of the court towards the east opposite the lobby and opposite the building were the sleeping-rooms and the walk in front of them was similar to the chambers which are to the north they were the same length and breadth with all their passages and arrangements and entrances and the entrances of the chambers that were towards the south opened at the top of the walk opposite the fence along the gangway of the east walk and he said to me the northern rooms and the southern rooms that face the lobby they are the reserved dormitories where the priests who approach the ever-living shall eat the most sacred things they shall store the most sacred things there the food offerings and the sin and trespass offerings for that part is sacred when the priests arrive they must not go to the outer court and place the robes in which they minister there for they are sacred but put on their other robes when they approach the people then when he had completed the measurements of the temple in the inner courts he led me out by way of the gate that faces towards the east and measured round it he measured towards the east wind with his measuring rod five hundred rods by measuring rod length he measured towards the north wind five hundred rods by the measuring rod length he measured towards the south wind five hundred rods by the measuring rod length he measured to the west wind five hundred rods by the measuring rod he measured to the four winds for a wall five hundred long and five hundred broad to encircle the temple to divide the holy from the defiled the end of chapters thirty seven through forty two recording by mark penfold